Hello and welcome to another lecture from my class, PSYC 440-640, which is called Experimental Methods, but it's really more of a univariate statistics class. So it's more about research data analysis than research methods. That said, in this lecture, I'll be continuing to talk a little bit about the research process, including research design and methods, because I think it's important to review this information and hopefully get kind of a solid foundation for um, the work that we'll be doing in much of the rest of the semester, where we'll be focusing again more on research data analysis. Um, here we have, just to begin, another excellent comic from the excellent webcomic series PhDComics.com. Uh, I'm including it here for no other reason than that my wife really likes Star Wars, and not too long ago we saw the latest in the Star Wars movies, and it reminded me of this comic which jokingly compares the Jedi from the Star Wars universe to professors from this universe, and sees uh, the points of similarity especially the playing mind tricks on you part. That makes me laugh because it reminds me of graduate school. Anyway, this class, uh, or this lecture for this class is called Research Design and Methods, and it talks about research design and methods, which are part of the overall research process. So if we think back to the last lecture, you'll remember I showed this flowchart from Andy Field's Discovering Statistics Using SPSS textbook, and it tries to uh, pictographically represent the overall research process, and beginning with the, with the stage at which you get an idea, and then going on down to an area that I'm calling research design, and then research methods, and ultimately to research data analysis, which as I've already said, is really the focus of this class. So reviewing about design and methods I think is useful because again it sets a bit of a foundation, hopefully it creates some connections between what goes on at these stages and what goes on at the later data analysis stage that will help the whole thing uh, seem more uh, memorable and relevant uh, to you. Uh, that's the hope at least, and that's kind of how it worked for me when I was a student, so hopefully it'll work for you too. So here's an overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about research design, specifically focusing on how we evaluate claims of cause and effect, because that's something that we, of course, work on a lot, or at least we think about a lot in the sciences, perhaps especially in the behavioral sciences. Um, I'm going to talk about research methods, talking a little bit about different types of variables, different ways of uh, evaluating error, especially measurement error. And as you can see here, I'll be touching upon the uh, distinction between internal and external validity of claims made based on res research. So let's begin by talking a little bit about research design and enjoying for a moment another great comic from phdcomics.com. This one comparing the scientific method as it's often represented in textbooks like our own with the scientific method as it actually occurs in the real world. Looking at this, uh, students of philosophy of science will probably be thinking of the difference between Karl Popper's vision of science and Thomas Kuhn's vision of science, some of which we'll talk about a little bit later in this class or in subsequent classes. Anyway, to go back to the uh, flowchart in our textbook, we're at that stage where we're, uh, we have or we have generated a theory and from that theory we're deriving some particular hypotheses and we have to identify uh, some variables uh, associated with these hypotheses which we can then subject uh, to measurement. So by way of a bit of a review from my last lecture, recall that a theory is just some sort of organized set of principles that seeks to describe or explain or we might even add predict uh, some phenomenon. And a hypothesis is a specific testable prediction that can be derived from that theory. Now often these predictions are made as claims about cause and effect relationships between one or more variables and some other variable. So we imagine that particular treatment in some way changes or affects the level of depression that people experience or some particular um, 
manipulation in the laboratory influences the speed with which people process information or some such claim. Uh, again, the idea here of a cause and effect claim can be important because cause and effect claims or understanding cause and effect claims is, is connected to understanding the mechanisms or underlying processes that govern uh, the world around us. So again, a, a lot of the theories that we, uh, that we are, are interested in evaluating, a lot of the hypotheses that we make to evaluate those theories uh, have to do with claims of cause and effect. And recall again from last time that the criteria for focusing uh, or for evaluating these claims of cause and effect include the following. Temporal precedence, you know, in this universe causes precede effects. Covariation, when the causing variable is moved or changed, the affecting variable is also moved or changed in a corresponding fashion. There's some sort of connection that can be observed in terms of their covariation. And finally, non-spuriousness, and this is really the most tricky part. Non-spuriousness refers to the quality um, of the relationship being um, unintruded upon by other variables. You know, we can't explain the apparent cause and effect relationship occurring because of the influence of some other variable, a third variable or a confounding variable. Now, figuring out if we have satisfied the criterion of non-spuriousness is often uh, really challenging. And if you take a class on research design, or if you read a good research design textbook, like for instance, Cook, uh, Campbell, and Shadish's book, Experimental and Quasi-Experimental Designs for General Causal Inference, which is a much more interesting book than you might guess from that title, um, you'll learn all sorts of different ways that people have come up with to try to establish good non-spuriousness in experimental and in quasi-experimental, as you can see, designs. So again, these are things we talked about last time. So with that in mind, let's move on and focus a little bit on research design. So let's imagine that we're interested in evaluating some sort of a cause and effect claim. And for the sake of simplicity, let's keep it simple. Uh, let's imagine that we're interested in the relationship between the use of a particular drug, let's say Paxil, it's an antidepressant, anti-anxiety drug, and level of depression. Now, there are all sorts of different ways we could study the relationship between these two variables. Um, broadly, though, we can consider all the studies that are either experiments against all the studies which are non-experiments. So is our study going to be experimental or non-experimental? This distinction is one that you've hopefully encountered in other classes, but, it, but if you haven't, by way of a quick review, recall that experimental designs are those in which the predictor or independent variable is in some way manipulated by the researcher and non-experimental designs are those in which the predictor or independent variable is not manipulated by the experimenter. Now, some textbooks, including ours, which is the Andy Field Discovering Statistics textbook, will sometimes refer to non-experimental designs as correlational. And this is because often what we're doing in a non-experimental design is observing a correlation between a predictor variable and some sort of an outcome variable or an independent variable and a dependent variable. Um, now we often do this by using correlational analyses, but the use of correlational analyses isn't restricted to only non-experimental designs. You could do correlational analyses in an experimental design, so I find this terminology a little bit misleading. I prefer the simpler, to me at least, distinction experimental versus non-experimental. So let's take those one at a time, considering first experimental design. How do we establish non-spuriousness in an experimental design? Often it's by comparing two or more conditions, one in which the putative cause is present and another in which it's absent. And this absent condition is called a counterfactual. It's our stand-in for what would happen in the present condition if that treatment or that um, predictor variable was not operating. And as a bit of a note here, let's observe that the strength of causal inference that we can make from an experimental design depends on the quality of that counterfactual. If we have a high quality counterfactual, a good quality control group or comparison group, then we feel usually more confident in making inferences about cause and effect relationships between independent and dependent variables than we do if our control group or comparison group that is our counterfactual, is really poor quality. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in future slides. So conti to continue with our simple example, we're considering an experimental design 
and there's a cause, a putative cause, which is our independent variable. It might be something like whether or not people in the study get Paxil as their treatment. They either get Paxil or they don't. So there are two levels of that independent variable, treated or not treated. And the effect is there a dependent variable, which will be some sort of measure of uh, depressive symptoms or social, uh, psychosocial functioning or something like that. We're trying to see if there is a non-spurious relationship between the type of treatment you get, that is, whether you get Paxil or not, and the level of depression that you subsequently experience. To be clear then, in the experimental designs, our independent variable is manipulated. The researchers assign, hopefully by random assignment, people to either get the drug or not get the drug. And then the dependent variable is measured sometime after the fact. So again, our theory might be something like paroxetine or Paxil is an efficacious treat, uh, antidepressant. That's a pretty vague theory. But at least it gives us a fairly uh, specific and testable hypothesis. Something like treatment group will show less depression than non-treatment group. That is, the people who get Paxil in our study will show less depression than the people who don't get Paxil. And if you prefer, prefer to think about these things pictographically, here's just a simple, rather generic, almost um, presentation of what our little experiment would look like. We have people who are clients, let's say at our counseling center, and we're going to assign people to either get uh, Paxil or not get Paxil. Again, hopefully we're doing this by random assignment so as to have the best chance of making our non-treated group a good counterfactual, a good comparison to our treated group, being that they'd be about the same on all variables except their treatment. And then down the line, we're measuring the dependent variable, which is some sort of measure of depression, maybe the Beck depression inventory or the Hamilton depression inventory or, or so on. We're trying to see, is there any difference between the two? So you can see here in an experimental design, the counterfactual is created by the manipulation. And it can be a control group, or it might be a placebo group. Maybe the people in our study who don't get Paxil are given some sort of like a, an inert pill, like a sugar pill, and they are told that they're receiving Paxil so as to equate both groups on the expectation of receiving drugs. You know, knowing the expectation or so-called placebo effect can influence variables like people's level of depression. So we have a control group, a placebo group, a comparison group. Um, However we define it, which is really a matter of design, uh, these all allow us to exert some level of experimental control on our study. And experimental control here means just the ability to rule out potential spurious effects from other variables. Um, good quality counterfactuals are ones that allow for a high degree of experimental control. We're trying to, again, we're trying to establish non-spuriousness examining the effect between the cause or independent variable and the effect or dependent variable, holding the influence of other variables, which would otherwise potentially be spurious, holding the influence of those other variables constant. And again, strength of this causal influence, uh, inference depends on the quality of this counterfactual. If we have a poor quality counterfactual, like for instance, um, we, you know, by bad luck or by sloppy assignment, end up with a control group that is much, much older than our treatment group. We might find that differences in levels of depression could be due to differences in treatment. You know, one group got Paxil, the other group didn't, or it could be due to differences in age, which is a spurious or confounding variable. You know, older people tend to have higher levels of depression than younger people. Or we might find due to either sloppy assignment or just bad luck that the uh, treatment group um, has a much higher concentration of males or a much higher prevalence, let's say, of males uh, than females, whereas the control group has a higher prevalence of females than males, we might find down the line that the control group reports a higher level of depression. That could be due to the fact that they didn't get the treatment, you know, they didn't get the Paxil, or it could be due to the fact that women uh, tend to experience more depression, or at least are it seem more likely to report depression than do men. So gender in that, ver in that uh, example would be a potentially confounding or spurious effect that we didn't rule out or experimentally control.
to compare all that, imagine we have a large sample which we rigorously and randomly assign to either get Paxil or not get Paxil. Those two groups, other than the fact that they differ in terms of the medication they take, are likely to be very similar to one another. Um, down the line, if they differ in depression levels measured uh, on our Beck depression inventory or whatever else, it's likely to be the case that that difference is due to their treatment. And we might feel pretty confident in making assertions or inferences about that cause effect relationship because we feel like we've got a pretty good quality counterfactual. We've established non spuriousness. We feel confident in our claim about a cause effect relationship. So let's switch over now and talk about non experimental designs. Here, the cause variables are called predictor variables. And the effect variables are called outcome variables. Now, as a side point, the, the reason why uh, in a, experimental designs causes are called independent variables, effects are called outcome variables, and why in non-experimental designs causes are called predictor variables and effects are called outcome variables is largely a matter of history and tradition. These, these sets of terms can really be used interchangeably. However, um, what is different uh, between non-experimental and ex uh, experimental and non-experimental designs is that in the non-experimental designs, both the predictor and the outcome variables are measured without any attempt to manipulate the predictor variables. We're not changing anything as researchers. We're just allowing that people in our study will have different levels of whatever our predictor variables are kind of by nature or by circumstances in their own lives. And we can measure those levels and see if they are related to levels of our outcome variable. So to kind of tweak our example here, we could imagine we have a theory that duration of use of Paxil or paroxetine is related to its effectiveness. That's a really general theory. But it gives us a fairly specific hypothesis that people who have been on Paxil for longer amounts of time will have less depression than people who have been on it for only a very short amount of time. So to try and represent this pictographically, we could have say that our predictor variable is duration of use of, of Paxil, maybe in like weeks of time. And our outcome variable is level of depression, and we're just looking to see if there's a relationship, a correlation between these two. Recall that sometimes non-experimental designs are called correlational designs because they often, although not always, but often use correlations as one of their feature, uh, sort of main featured analyses. Now, in non-experimental designs, the counterfactual isn't something that we make or, or, or design like we do in, in experimental studies. Rather, uh, it's something that we can infer based on the type of data we gather and the type of analyses that we do. So take a look at this scatter plot here, and let's imagine that on the x-axis we have weeks of time on Paxil. And on the uh, x-axis, I'm sorry, on the y-axis, we have level of depression as measured by, let's say, uh, the Beck depression inventory. Uh, now, we'd like to say that there is a pretty straightforward relationship such that the longer people are on Paxil, the lower on average their level of depression is. And that's possible, it's, it's likely, but there could be other variables that might influence this apparent cause-effect relationship. Um, maybe people who are on uh, who are on the drug for longer have lower levels of side effects. You know, uh, there are all sorts of side effects associated with SSRIs like Paxil, and maybe it's the case that people who are on the drug for eight weeks were able to tolerate it for that long because they had lower levels of side effects, and so they're on the whole doing quite a lot better, whereas people who are on the drug for only a couple weeks had very high levels of side effects, and those side effects made them uncomfortable or even contributed to their depression. So we could, if we wanted to, measure level of side effects. So you know, we might be able to develop or find questionnaires that ask about the types of side effects people have from this drug. And when measuring those, equate our people in our sample on a particular level of uh, side effects and see if after doing so, there's a, and still a relationship between duration of use and level of depression. So we might say if we equate people in our study such that all folks, we imagine all folks have the same level of side effects, would we nonetheless see a relationship between duration of use 
and level of depression. Um, this is a matter of you know, statistical calculation and inference more so than it is a matter of design. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about statistical control uh, in the future, especially in unit two, but just to introduce it right now, the basic idea is in non-experimental designs, we're judging or we're inferring the statistical control um, or the counterfactual, whereas in experimental designs, we're more explicitly designing it. So if your head is spinning a little bit from all the information I've just thrown at you, let's try and slow it down and focus on a couple important ideas. And the first is that research design usually involves selecting between two options for the type of study you want to do. Do you want to have an experimental study or a non-experimental study? And the other interesting or important idea is that research design involves figuring out how to manage confounds. Remember, of our three criteria for establishing causality, non-spuriousness is often the trickiest to pin down. And so in the case of experimental uh, studies, we're often thinking about experimental control, trying to design a comparison group or control group or placebo group, design a counterfactual that will rule out as best as possible all the potential confounds or spurious effects that could occur. In the case of uh, non-experimental studies, we're thinking ahead, hopefully, to the type of statistical control we would like to do, measuring uh, potential confounding variables so that we can use this information in our analyses and rule out, statistically at least, the effects of these confounding variables. Okay, so part of design involves considering causality from the perspective of a, an experimental study or a non-experimental study, and part of research design involves thinking about variation. And in a way, variation is a really easy idea to think about. It's just that not all values of a given variable are the same. So if we look at our scatter plot again and recall that the y-axis is supposed to be level of depression, maybe as measured by the Beck Depression Inventory, we can see here clearly that of all the folks in this study, uh, they don't all have the same level of depression. Some have relatively higher levels of depression, some have relatively lower levels of depression. We'd like to explain that variation if we can. And when we think about variation, we can think about two basic kinds of variation, systematic and non-systematic. Systematic variation is variation that's associated with our predictor variable or our independent variable. So in the previous slide, which, which I can't go back to because it'll erase the previous narration that I've recorded, um, you remember, of course, that um, as, the, uh, as we go to higher and higher levels on the x-axis, uh, the dots in the scatter plot occur at lower and lower levels on the y-axis. So it seems to be the case that the longer people are on Paxil, the lower their depression is. So one way of explaining the variation, the overall variation in level of depression, is to say that some amount of that variation has to do with how long people have been on the drug, the predictor variable, uh, you know, weeks of time on Paxil some amount of that variation is unsystematic. Un unsystematic variation is just variation that is not associated with our predictor variable or variables and therefore must be associated with some sort of confounding variables. So again, if you, if you sort of rewind the recording and look at that previous uh, scatter plot or just remember what it looks like, you'll remember or see that even at a given level of the predictor variable, at two weeks, at six weeks, at eight weeks, not all the people at any one time point have the same level of depression. So at the eight week time point, there's one person who has relatively lower depression and a couple of people have relatively higher depression. Now, clearly their difference at that time point doesn't have to do with level of their treatment, or duration of their treatment, because they've all been on dr the drug for the same amount of time. It must have to do with something else. What that something else is, we don't know. You know it could be um, level of comorbid diagnosis of anxiety. It could be level of alcohol use. It could be age. It could be gender. Who knows? To the extent that we don't know, it is necessarily unsystematic, or we sometimes even call it random, um, because we can't exactly model it. So fundamental idea here is we have variation, and variation can be either systematic or explained, or it can be unsystematic or unexplained.
Unsystematic variation is often used interchangeably with error. And that idea or that, that connection actually goes back to the early days of science, especially the early days of astronomy back in the 18th and, and 19th century. You know, back then, when people were uh, astronomers, were observing uh, the location of celestial bodies and trying to make relatively precise recordings of them, they noticed that even on you know the same night, at the same telescope, at almost exactly the same time, two different people making a recording would not always get the same exact measurements in terms of you know, degrees of, of elevation or you know, degrees of longitude or latitude or whatever. And so initially the idea was, well, one of the people recorded it correctly, probably the most senior astronomer, or the one who paid for the telescope to be constructed, and everyone else got it wrong. So they were all in error. A more modern notion of this is just that there is variation around whatever the true uh, correct answer is, which is in a sense almost unknowable, and that in, but that variation is unsystematic. It can't be mapped onto any known predictor variable. Uh, so variation, especially unsystematic variation, is often used kind of interchangeably with error, even to this day. Although personally, I find that that uh, substitution or that synonymization a little bit confusing because we're not necessarily talking about error in the sense of you made a mistake. It's just that error in the sense that not all the measurements line up the way we wish they would. Well, if 18th century astronomy is too old school for you, let's, let's get more modern and think about communication, especially wireless communication today. Here we have the idea of signal and noise. So if you look on the left part of this, uh, of this image, you see kind of a, a scraggly line that goes up and down. Imagine that's a radio source or a wireless source that you can pick up with a device, like a receiver of some sort. That source can be uh, reduced to a signal, you know, the particular uh, message or frequency you want to receive, and all the other junk which gets in the way or distorts it, the noise. Um, using this, this idea or this metaphor, we can see that signal and noise are correspond to systematic and unsystematic variation in any source, whether it's a radio wave or a column of numbers in our data set, there's a certain amount of uh, signal that we want to measure, you know, the effect of our particular predictor variable. And then there's the noise, all the other stuff which distorts the uh, data away from or, or kind of clouds in front of the signal. By the way, I should say that that uh, metaphor of signal and noise was made tremendously popular by uh, Nate Silver's book on uh, statistics and prediction, uh, The Signal and the Noise, uh, which I highly recommend reading. It's, it's quite interesting. It's also quite quotable. Uh, here's a, a great quote from it. The signal is the truth. The noise is what distracts us from the truth. And you know that applies uh, to the type of research we do as well. If you have uh, a column or several columns of data in your data set and you're trying to discern the relationship between the predictor variables and the outcome variable, there's a certain hopefully true signal there that you're trying to discover, but there's also noise, all the effects of confounding variables, which you might try to reduce or remove or control in some way. So a few important ideas. Design involves thinking about variation, variation in the outcome variable specifically, and trying to discern within that variation the systematic variation or the signal from the non-systematic variation or the noise or, or the error. And design also involves figuring out how to reduce non-systematic uh, error or non-systematic variation relative to systematic variation, which again takes this form of experimental or statistical control. Okay, so how do we study variation in the context of an experimental design? Well, here within experimental designs, we have some choices. It, it depends if we're doing an independent experimental design, then what we're going to be doing is comparing two or more groups at one point in time. These are sometimes called like between subjects or between groups designs. And what we typically do is we randomly assign participants in our study to be in one and only one group. So you know, this is why they're called independent designs. People who come into your study are randomly assigned to either be in the treatment group that gets the Paxil or the no treatment group that doesn't get the Paxil.
Now this random assignment to group is important, as I've talked about before, because it helps to make the groups similar. And this is, uh, this is probabilistic. It depends on the sample size. It depends on, on luck. You know, a random assignment to group with a very small sample in, in a study doesn't do much for you, but random assignment to group in a st uh, study with a very large sample probabilistically equates those groups on all the different variables that would differ, uh, that they could differ on, except for the fact that one group gets the treatment and the other group doesn't. This is an example of experimental control designed to minimize confounds. So again, here's our rather generic pictographic representation. We're taking people and we're randomly assigning them to levels of the independent variable, and then we are measuring them on levels of the outcome variable. It's kind of a classic independent experimental design. Now, another option we have when we're doing experiments are dependent designs. These are where we're comparing one uh, group, or it could be more than one group, at two or more times. And these are sometimes called within subject designs or repeated measures designs. These are just other terms to refer to uh, independent, I'm sorry, to dependent designs. And here we sometimes randomly assign people to the order uh, of the different levels of the independent variable that they get. This is sometimes called counterbalancing. And again, the idea here is to minimize confounding effects. So you could imagine having a group of clients who are randomly assigned to get the treatment, let's say get Paxil for six weeks and then have a washout period where they get no Paxil for six weeks, or they get no Paxil for six weeks and then are treated for six weeks. Um, the interesting thing in this design is what we'd be doing is we'd be comparing people to themselves across those two time points to see what the average change is between being on Paxil and not being on Paxil. Again, these are sometimes called repeated measures designs because we're repeatedly measuring something, level of depression at multiple time points to observe that change. A third option we have are mixed experimental designs. These are just designs that have elements of both independent and dependent designs. So we might have multiple independent groups, each measured at multiple times. That would give us a mixed uh, experimental design. The important idea here is that experiments can be designed in different ways that have to do with when and how we are measuring the outcome variable. These can be independent, dependent, or mixed designs. And here uh, I've just created like a little bit of a, 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 a um, a family tree, if you will, to show that we can divide all empirical studies into those that are experimental and those that are non-experimental, and we could divide all experimental designs into those that are independent, those that are dependent, and those that are mixed. And note here, um, this distinction between independent and dependent outcome variables exists in non-experimental research too. We just don't as often in non-experimental designs make the distinction between independent and dependent and mixed. So at the level of research design, part of what we're considering is the type of study we're doing, experimental or non-experimental. Part of what we're considering is the type of variation in the outcome or dependent vari variable that we're observing and how we can best minimize the unsystematic variation in that variable. Another thing we're thinking about is validity, a specific kind of validity called internal validity. And we'll get to that in just a second. But before we do, let's just note that validity in a general sense means accuracy or truthfulness. And there are different ways of looking at validity or thinking about it. In fact, in another class I uh, teach sometimes, I used to joke that if you open up a dictionary of statistics and research methods, of which I have quite a few, and you look up validity, the authors of those dictionaries will often list just page after page of different types and flavors of validity. And now is not the time for all of that, but now is the time to talk about one specific kind of validity that I think is really important for research design. And that type of validity is internal validity. And here I mean the internal validity of the inference you make, of the causal inference you make uh, based on the results of your study. Now, internal validity means the strength or the confidence that you have 
in your inference. If you make the inference based on the results of your study that treatment with Paxil decreases depression or that duration of treatment with Paxil is related to reduction in depression symptoms. Um, how confident you can feel in the correctness of that claim is the internal validity of the study. And th this isn't something that's arbitrary. You, you don't get to just say, well, well I feel confident, therefore the study has good internal validity. Rather, you can have uh, confidence or you can feel strength in that inference based on the quality of your counterfactual, based on your ability to rule out confounds. We found that with a large sample randomly assigned to group, there was a strong association between treatment with Paxil and decreased level of depression. This doesn't seem to be associated with other potential confounding variables uh, because we've ruled them out with large sample and random assignment. Or you know, we've statistically controlled for potential confounds like anxiety or alcohol use or gender or age and nonetheless we see a relationship between duration of treatment and reduction in depression symptoms. Um, these are all claims uh, uh, about the relationship between Paxil and depression and the strength that we have or that we feel in these claims has to do with how well we can rule out these compounds. In fact, if you take a class on research methods uh, or if you look through research methods textbooks, you'll often encounter long lists of threats to internal validity. And these are just all sorts of different factors or conditions which might weaken this causal inference by introducing doubt about the possibility that maybe some confounding variable which was not uh, statistically or experimentally controlled for influenced the apparent cause-effect relationship between your independent or predictor variable your dependent or outcome variable. So just to highlight a few threats to internal validity in experiments, maybe we have a poor counterfactual. Maybe our groups differ from one another for, uh, for reasons other than just our manipulation. So maybe we were sloppy, maybe we didn't do random assignment, maybe we did and we just got unlucky and it just turned out to be the case that the people in the treatment group were um, you know, more depressed than people in the non-treatment group prior to getting any sort of treatment. Uh, or we've, the people in the non-treatment group were older than the folks in the treatment group, or so on and so on. This can happen, uh, and these confounding variables can obscure or confuse, can introduce noise into our um, understanding of the apparent cause-effect relationship between our independent and dependent variable. In non-experimental studies, poor counterfactuals are a little bit harder to explain, but they have to do with situations in which the predictor variable is correlated with the confounding variable. So if we try to statistically control for a confounding variable that is itself highly correlated with the predictor variable in our study, we often have a very hard time ruling out that confounding variable. We'll talk a lot about this in unit two of the class when we consider correlation and multiple regression analysis. So what do we do about this? Well, generally speaking, larger samples are helpful for internal validity and also for external validity, as we'll see. Random assignment is helpful for experiments because with large samples, it tends to probabilistically um, equate groups on levels of confounding variables. Also a nice bit of advice is to measure, if possible, potential confounding variables to check uh, that that assignment has worked correctly or that groups are uh, equated on those variables or potentially to include those confounding variables as interaction terms in our model. Uh, again, something we'll talk about a lot in unit two. Bottom line is there are ways to um, manage threats to internal validity, but they can be challenging, especially in non-experimental studies. So important idea here is that internal validity refers to the strength or the confidence we have in a claim, especially one that is a causal inference between a, a predictor and outcome variable or independent and dependent variable. And internal validity has to do with the quality of the counterfactual that we have in our study, how well it helps us to rule out the potential effects of confounding variables. Here's an interesting idea. Often less can be done to limit the threats to internal validity with non-experiments than with experiments. 
And that's why it's usually harder to draw causal inferences from the results of non-experiments than it is from the results of experiments. And uh, you know, when I wrote this slide, I thought a lot, uh, for some reason, I guess, about uh, the research that we read about uh, healthy diets. Uh, so, you know, week to week, or month to month, it seems like there are, you know, studies come out which suggest that particular foods are very healthy or very unhealthy for us to eat. Some of this research is experimental in nature. People are brought into laboratories or followed for long periods of time and randomly assigned to eat a certain diet versus another type of diet. But typically, a lot of this research is non-experimental. Um, it is, you know, researchers go out into the world and find that some people tend to uh, drink a lot of red wine, other people don't, or some people tend to eat a lot of vegetables, other people don't. And the researchers measure these diet differences and then measure health differences either at that same time or, or down the road. The problem here is that people who differ in terms of the amount of red wine they drink may also differ in terms of other variables like the amount of exercise they get or the amount of sleep that they get. Uh, people who tend to eat, you know, diets rich in uh, vegetables may also tend to, you know, cook at home more and have less stress in their lives. And these things, these other variables, these confounds, potentially are influencing the outcome variable, whether it's health or overall health or blood pressure or or so on. Um, as a result, the literature, and I'm not trying to pick on people who study nutrition and dietetics, but the literature often looks like a big confusing mess, at least from the perspective of making strong causal claims. The internal validity of a lot of this research is pretty suspect, and not because the people who do it are, are, are stupid or incompetent, but just because they're studying complicated things, human health, human diets, uh, often using non-experimental methods, which are challenging for that purpose. Okay, so I've talked a lot about research design. Let's move on and talk a little bit about research methods. And to kick it off, let's look at another great webcomic from phdcomics.com. Uh, this one really makes me laugh because it reminds me a lot of my master's thesis study, which was a uh, psychophysiological study using an alcohol dosing paradigm way back in grad school. And I remember in my notebook drawing these kind of idealized diagrams of how my uh, experimental apparatus should work. You know, I'll have a certain, uh, you know, stimulus presentation uh, computer that will be connected to my data acquisition computers and so on and so on. Uh, on the right, uh, that's on the left, and on the right is something that looks disturbingly like what my laboratory really looked like, an absolute Frankenstein mess of different computers and psychophysiological gear all wired together that hopefully, maybe, as it turned out, actually did just barely work to get me the data that I needed. And that's research methods. <laughs> Here's another image. This is obviously our flowchart from our textbook. And just to orient us, we're now at the stage of the research process where we're collecting data to uh, test our theory, or more precisely, it really should say, to test the hypothesis, which is de uh, derived from our theory. And in order to do that, we have to measure variables of some sort. We, we've picked our variables that we want to study, and we have to measure them in some way. At the stage of research design, we're concerned with choosing variables for our study. And at the stage of research methods, we're concerned with operationalizing those variables. That is, figuring out how we're actually going to measure them. So just as an example of this, let's think of our experimental design where our independent variable was Paxil. Maybe we would operationalize that as the dose of the drug in milligrams per day. Um, maybe that dose is going to be standard across all the people in our study, or maybe it's going to be, you know, uh, dose at the recommended uh, physician's guidelines for the drug. I mean, you can imagine there are different choices we might have as to how we, we operationalize or how we actually measure what the dose is of our independent variable. Our dependent variable, we have different choices as well. It's depression, but let's say we're operationalizing that as the score on the Beck Depression Inventory. Now, if you're a clinical psychologist or a clinical psychology student, you know that the Beck Depression Inventory, while generally considered a reliable and valid measure of depression symptoms, is by no means the gold standard for measuring uh, that construct. There are other choices we have, but for the purpose of, of our study, maybe that's a good way to operationalize depression. Um, the point here is that as a research, um, as a research methodologist, uh, you usually have choices and it's important to think carefully about the choices you make when designing and uh, sort of setting up the methodology of your study.
It's also worth noting that variables can be thought of as diff in different ways, or, or rather, there are different types of variables which you might consider when picking the operationalization of the variables in your study. The first type of variable are categorical variables. These are variables that have distinct values that correspond to attributes or conditions or events. So we might, um, in conducting a study, we might at some point measure people's racial or ethnic or cultural identity. Um, that's an attribute that people uh, can identify about themselves or they, they often choose to identify about themselves and we can make some sort of rec recording of that in our data set. You know, one equals Caucasian slash white, two equals African American slash black, three equals Latin American slash Hispanic, four equals and so on and so on. Now those numbers, one, two, three, four, however many numbers we have, um, each represent a distinct value or, or state, but there's no real numerical relationship between them. It's not like, you know, the one variable is, you know, one less than the two variable, or if you add the one and the two together, you get three. These are just placeholders or, or codes to refer to these different states. Um, what those are just simple, a categorical way of classifying information. Another type of variable are ordinal variables. Ordinal variables, as you could guess from their name, refer to orders or ranks in magnitude. So the, you know, the example that you'd see in a statistics textbook would be something like if you were measuring a race, uh, you know, people you know, can be ranked in terms of who crosses the finish line first. Or maybe a, a better example would be something like if you were studying in educational psychology or school psychology, it might be fairly common to look at class rankings, you know, who's top of the class, who is second from top of the class, and so on and so on. Here, the values that we assign, one, two, three, four, have a numerical relationship to each other. Um, in the sense that one is first, second comes next, third comes next, and so on. That's different from with nominal variables, which have no real numerical relationship to each other. However, what's important with ordinal variables is that that relationship um, is not well defined across the full range of values. So the person who is first from in the race might only be ever so slightly quicker than the person who's second. And the person who's second may be ever so slightly quicker than the person who's third, but the person who's third might be quite a lot quicker than the person who's fourth. You know, there's there, the gaps in between those numbers are not a fixed amount or fixed value. Uh, and that may not be important in some situations, but it may in others. You know, if you're you know, the difference between the people in the first, uh, the 99th and the 98th percentile of the class may be quite a lot different than the difference between the people in the sort of first and second percentile of the class. Now the third type of variable that we can uh, choose when we're, when we're thinking about how to operationalize the variables in our study are continuous variables. Continuous variables are variables which have scores associated with them. So uh, these are the types of variables that we often encounter in psychology, at least especially the psychology that works with human beings, where people fill out a self-report questionnaire, like the Beck Depression Inventory. People who fill out that questionnaire have scores. Now, we can think of continuous variables as having sort of two basic types or features. There are interval scales. These are uh, scales where we assume that the intervals between different values represent fairly equal differences. So uh, imagine the Beck Depression Inventory, uh, you know, someone who scores a 10 um, is more depressed than someone who scores an 8, but less depressed than someone who scores a 12. And those differences are assumed to be about the same. There's an assumption of underlying uh, intervals being rather equivalent. Now, methodologists, you know, people who are uh, psychometrists point out that this is often a pretty bad assumption to make in the realm of a lot of the self-report measures. You know, is it really the case that people who are, you know, 20 points on the Beck Depression Inventory are like twice as depressed as people who are 10? Maybe not, but we often treat this data as if it was a continuous variable with a basically uh, um, appropriate interval scale. Another form of continuous variable are those which have ratio scales. Ratio scales um, allow us to more, you know, more uh, precisely make meaningful ratios, uh, and also, and this is important, often have true and meaningful zeros. So um, you encounter these, for instance, in psychophysiology, an area that I used to study in a little bit, something like heart rate, which you might measure um, as a 
operationalization of physiological arousal or maybe even as an operationalization of stress response can be measured different ways but you know one way would be like beats per minute and beats per minute can range uh, up from a low of zero where the, you know, the person's dead to a very very high level like maybe you know over 100 if someone's exerting themselves or if they're very stressed out and those differences you know have a meaningful zero zero heartbeats a minute is meaningful and also the ratio between them is more sensible and more well understood so someone who has 120 beats per minute heartbeat is beating twice as fast as someone who's got 60 heartbeats a minute there's less of the uncertainty than with continuous variables which are more interval in nature. So again, if your head's spinning a bit and you're trying to keep focused on the important points, here's a bit of a summary. Methods, uh, um, method sections, or sort of the method section of the research process involves operationalizing variables, which is just a fancy way of saying deciding how we're going to measure them. And there are different choices for how we can operationalize a variable. Um, those can involve nominal, ordinal, and various forms of continuous uh, scaling for our variables. So when we're thinking about research methods for our study, we're thinking in part about how we operationalize the variables that we're going to try to measure, what sort of scaling we're going to use uh, for the variables that we're interested in, whether it's drug dose or level of depression and so on. We should also be thinking about measurement error. Measurement error is just defined as the discrepancy between the actual value of a particular measurement and the observed value of that particular measurement. So if I administer a set of Beck depression inventories to a bunch of different people, each of those folks is going to have a particular score. And for each person, I can ask myself, how much does this score reflect how depressed this person really is? And we have to acknowledge that there's almost certainly some sort of a discrepancy between the score we have and the score that that person in a sense should have if we could measure his or her depression with total accuracy and consistency. We think about this idea of error and we think about a connected idea which is reliability. How reliable is our measure? And reliability, you've certainly encountered this term in other classes before. Um, it can be defined in different ways, but typically when we talk about reliability, we're talking about the consistency or the repeatability of a measure. And this issue of reliability, of course it comes up in psychology, but it comes up in other sciences as well. I mean, consider the humble ruler, or I guess in this picture, a tape measure. You know, you're familiar with this and it's uh, these type of measurements. They're used for measuring length. So you might have a particular ruler to measure the length of a side of your desk that you're sitting at. Now, odds are if you measure your desk and then you measure your desk again and a few days later you measure it again you'll be getting pretty much the same measurements each time but you're probably not getting exactly the same measurements each time there may be subtle differences or changes that are occurring during the times that you're repeatedly measuring such as changes in atmospheric humidity which maybe cause the uh, wood in the ruler to swell or shrink uh, changes in your level of attentiveness as you're making those measures so some days you're probably a little bit more careful and other days you're a little less careful the point is with even something as humble and as straightforward as a ruler or a tape measure i suppose there's going to be some amount of inconsistency in measurements over time um, that's true in measuring physical objects in the real world and it's certainly true in terms of measuring abstract constructs like the things that psychologists often study now the extent to to the extent that a measurement is consistent and repeatable um, we call it reliable to the extent that it isn't we call it unreliable. Now that's simple and there's some complexity here. There, there are different ways of thinking about reliability. So if this was a research methods class we might spend a lot of time talking about different kinds of reliability or different kinds of consistency. We can ask you know is a does a measure show good temporal consistency or inter-rater consistency or internal consistency and so on and so on. It's a bit like reliability I, I'm sorry a bit like validity. You could look up in a, a dictionary and find many many different types or flavors of reliability. For our purposes right now, we're really focusing on measurements and the relationship between reliability and measurement error. And so recall that if a measure has a lot of in, uh, measurement error associated with it, if it's sort of an error-prone measure, then it's going to yield 
very inconsistent uh, data. Um, and it's going to reflect a lot of unsystematic variation. So if your tape measure or if your ruler was made of very stretchy material, it would tend to be really inconsistent in the types of measurements you make time after time after time. There would be a lot of unsystematic variation in those measurements, and we would say that those measurements had little reliability. You know, likewise, if you had some sort of questionnaire that asked about mood symptoms or some sort of other uh, features of an abstract psychological construct, and if those measurements were pretty variable over time, um, in terms of how people responded to them, there'd be a lot of unsystematic variation, a lot of measurement error. And the point I'm trying to make here is that reliability is like the opposite of error. So if a measure is very reliable, there's little measurement error. If a measure is very unreliable, there's a lot of measurement error, a lot of unsystematic variation in the data that we can get from that measure. So the important idea I'm trying to get at here is that the stage in the research process that we call research methods is a lot about selecting different methods, or different approaches to measurement for the variables that we're interested in. Different ways of operationalizing those variables, different methods of scaling when we actually try to get quantitative data on those variables and so on. Now, when we're selecting among different types of measures, we almost always have some choices, we should be choosing measures which are reliable, which have low measurement error. You imagine you're doing a study looking at the relationship between treatment of, with Paxil and depression, and you have a choice of quite a few different measures of depression. One of your uh, criteria for choosing among those different measures, those different options, would be measurement error, aka reliability aka low rely or high reliability so choosing a measure which is very reliable this is really important now why is it important well it's important because measures that have high measurement error um, have by definition high unsystematic variability and that means that those measures are measuring the thing that we're interested in, let's say depression, but they're also measuring something else, or at least some things else. There are other confounding variables which are contributing to that variability in measurement. Now we don't necessarily know what those confounding variables are, but they're confusing, or at least they're potentially going to confuse or obscure the cause-effect relationships that we're interested in. So again, imagine that you had a uh, measure of depression, which measured depression, the thing you were interested in, but also, unbeknownst to you, measured things like transient ch uh, changes in people's level of anxiety, or transient changes in people's level of um, wakefulness or sleepfulness, things which are interesting, but at least in your mind, aren't directly connected to depression. To the extent that your measure was measuring this other junk, it would tend to yield Un highly unreliable measurements of depression, and that would be bad. You know, it would make it harder for you to find, if there is such an effect, an effect between whatever treatment you're giving and depression, the thing that you're trying to measure as your outcome variable or your dependent variable. Okay, so with a little bit of discussion of reliability out of the way, let's go back to talk about validity. Again, just as a review, validity generically or generally refers to accuracy or, or truthfulness and, and as I noted before there are different ways of thinking about validity. If we're in the realm of research methods, if we're taking a research methods class, we could talk a lot about different types of validity for different types of measures. Uh, what is the content validity of your questionnaire? What is the criterion validity of your questionnaire or your psychophysiological recording? What's the construct validity of this measurement? And so on and so on. Again, research methods and testing classes, you know, if you've ever taken a class on psychometrics, you know, I teach a class that covers a lot of psychometrics, you'd spend a lot of time talking about all the different ways that you can assess these different types of validity of measurements. Um, we're not going to go into all of that right now. For our purposes, I want to move on and introduce a couple interesting ideas about a particular type of validity. But before I get there, I just want to introduce kind of an interesting idea. I think it's an interesting idea. And that idea is that reliability limits validity. Um, in the sense that an unreliable measure can't be all that valid because, again, it's measuring things other than the thing it's supposed to measure. It's measuring confounding variables. 
you know, you uh, are maybe familiar with the old saying that a broken clock is right twice a day. So if you had an old analog clock that didn't move at all, you know, the, the spring mechanism is broken, the hands were stuck in one position, at least twice a day it would be correct. You know, if it just happened to be the case that it's, uh, you know, whatever, 2.34 uh, and you look at the clock, well, the clock's correct. Um, then 12 hours later you look at the clock again and the clock's correct. That uh, broken clock is reliable, or uh, that broken clock is right twice a day. But what if the clock was broken in a way such that the hands were still moving, but they were moving at uneven paces? You know, they would sometimes speed up and sometimes slow down. That clock would be very unreliable. There'd be a lot of variability in how it measured time, because again, the arms are speeding up and slowing down, which they shouldn't do, of course. Um, that clock might never be accurate. It might never yield the correct time. So maybe that maybe that uh, maybe that sort of example is is too um, too obscure or confusing. But the idea that I think is really important or really interesting is the reliability of a measurement, whether it's a clock or a ruler or a questionnaire about depression, kind of sets a ceiling on the validity of that instrument. If a measurement is very reliable, it has at least the potential to be quite valid. But if a measurement has very low reliability, it can never be all that valid for whatever it is it's going to measure. So I think that's an interesting idea. Hopefully that comes across to you as you're watching this video. So I said before there are different types of validity. I'm going to focus for the rest of this class on just one type, and that is external validity. And here we're talking about external validity of the inference that we're making from the results of our study, from the data and the observed relationships in the data that we, that we gather in our study. External validity is usually defined as the generalizability of a claim. So you might find, based on the results of your study, that treatment with Paxil seems to be associated with decreased depression as compared to you know, no treatment with Paxil. That's a claim, and that's a claim that might generalize to other people or it might generalize to other types of manipulations or measures. So you might, you, know, you might say like, oh, in our study, in our sample, we observed <clears throat> that the people who got the Paxil on average had lower levels, levels of depression than the people who didn't get the Paxil. Someone might ask, wow, would you see that same effect or a similar effect if you had a different sample from the population, like a different group of people? That's a question of external validity. They might even ask, you know, would you see a similar effect if you drew a sample from a different population? Maybe instead of focusing on college students at a counseling center, you focused on you know, um, adults in a community mental health setting, a somewhat different population, we could imagine. Or the person could ask, like, hey, it's interesting you've observed this effect with your measure of depression, which was, let's say, the Beck Depression Inventory, but would you see a similar effect if you had a different measure of depression? Maybe the Hamilton Depression Inventory, or a clinician's interview to diagnose depression. Or would you see a similar effect if you used a slightly different manipulation, a slightly different dose of Paxil, or a slightly different drug that's maybe chemically similar to Paxil? These are all questions about how much we think that the inference we're drawing, you know, treatment with Paxil or treatment with an SSRI changes depression, how much that inference will generalize to slightly different samples, slightly different populations, or even slightly different manipulations. And kind of like I talked about with internal validity, if you took a research methods class, you may have encountered long chapters on different threats to external validity. Like one of my favorite research methods textbooks just goes on and on and on about all the different threats to external validity that you might have to contend with if you're considering the research methods of your particular study. The general point of all of this is that threats to external validity are things which limit the generalizability of a claim. So if you didn't catch it before, I'll, I'll sort of say it again. One thing that might limit the generalizability of our claim is the extent to which our sample reflects the overall population that it was drawn from. You know, let's imagine that our sample um, 
is not particularly representative of the overall population. I, you know, I found these pictures online, of course, and I like them because, you know, let's imagine your sample is only people in yellow shirts. <laughs> but the real population that these folks are drawn from is quite diverse and includes people with all sorts of different colored shirts. I think these are folks who are in the Navy, and this is some sort of like mustering of Navy seamen or something like that, but it hopefully illustrates the point. If your sample isn't particularly representative of the overall population that you've drawn it from, then we might well wonder whether any effects that we observe in your sample would generalize to that broader population. They might, but, but then again, they might not. Um, so this is one threat to external validity, is kind of poor sampling or kind of um, uh, not representative sampling. How do we reduce this threat to external validity? Well, we could draw a larger sample. We could draw a more representative sample, which would hopefully be more reflective of the overall population. Or we could seek to measure different potential confounding variables, things which might make our sample quite different from the overall population and try to statistically control for them, although that's quite tricky often. The best thing we could do is go back and draw a bigger, better, and by better I mean more representative sample, because if we did, and if we still observed a similar effect, you know, treatment of Paxil on depression, then we'd feel a lot more confident about making broad claims about this effect being generalizable to the population. Another threat to external validity comes from our choice of methods and manipulations. So we can ask, do our manipulations and our measures, like in this case, the Beck depression in inventory reflect the different ways that that variable depression really occurs. You know, the Beck depression inventory, although it's a well-regarded instrument, really only captures some features of depression. And, and certainly there are other ways of measuring depression that might capture things which are not quite included in the Beck depression inventory. So again, you could imagine running a study and observing a particular change in people's depression as a consequence of a treatment, and you observe that change using the Beck depression inventory, and your colleague says something like, or asks you something like, do you think you'd see that effect if you measured depression using a clinician's interview, or using a report scale filled out by the partners and spouses of the people in your study. You know, maybe the people who are filling out your Beck depression inventory are not all that insightful about themselves. Maybe there's something you're missing. Now, that's fundamentally a, a question about the external validity of the claim that you're making. And one way you could do that, or one way you could address that, would be to try to improve your measures and manipulations, maybe including multiple measures of depression in your study rather than just one. To the extent that you did that and you found changes in depression which are consistent across different measures, you might feel more confident saying, yeah, I think this treatment really does affect depression because I've observed it in multiple ways within this one study. That makes me feel confident that my claim broadly about the effect of treatment on depression would generalize to other different ways of thinking about or measuring depression. So again, a way to reduce threats to external validity is often to improve the measures and manipulations that we're, we're doing. So, you know, instead of using just the Beck depression inventory, maybe hire some trained mental health professionals to conduct interviews and make formal diagnoses. Doing so, in a sense, what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to decrease unsystematic variation that might be associated with just one form of measurement by combining multiple forms of measurement. Hopefully you're following along with this. I know this can be a bit tricky sometimes. To summarize a bit, I'll say the important ideas are that external validity refers to the generalizability of claims that we make based on the results of our study. Um, we're asking, you know, would we see those same effects? Would we be able to make those same claims in new samples of participants from the same population or even different populations? Or with new samples of stimuli, meaning new samples of methods and manipulations that were, would be relevant to whatever constructs we're studying. So external validity has to do with the quality of the sample, the extent to which it's representative of the population it's drawn from, or indeed of other populations, and the quality of the sample of research methods, the extent to which they're representative of uh, different ways of measuring that same variable. So to move on ever so slightly, here's another one of those kind of interesting, at least I think it's interesting, 
ideas, and that is that often threats to external validity are more severe with experiments than with non-experiments. Experiments, by definition, are these contrived situations. You've brought someone into your laboratory and you've introduced a manipulation that might be quite different than the person would encounter in their outside living or their outside life. Um, now the value there is you have tight control over confounding variables, good experimental control, which helps to increase your internal validity, but it can tend to challenge or decrease your external validity. You know, as an example of, of this, you know, back uh, in my graduate school years, which seemed like a long time ago these days, um, my master's thesis involved looking at the relationship between alcohol consumption and fearfulness. Um, because you know, there's this general idea that alcohol makes people fearless or reckless. They're likely to do things that they would otherwise feel um, afraid to do, like you know, get into fights or have unprotected sex or drive a car or things like that. Now, how did I measure alcohol? Well, I had people drink standardized doses of alcohol that I mixed up based on chemistry grade alcohol and a mixer in my in my laboratory. Now that's pretty different than the type of drinks people would consume if they're out at a bar or out at a party. How did I measure fearfulness? Well I used a psychophysiological recording technique that involved having people sit in a quiet, mostly dark room, watching sets of images pop up on a computer screen and periodically hearing loud noises through a set of headphones. When they did this they would blink and I could measure that blink using a set of electrodes placed just under their eyes. So that's pretty different than almost any situation that people would commonly be in in their day-to-day -day life, let alone a situation in which they would be drinking. It's a highly unusual situation and some might, someone might well ask, you know, given that I observed with the help of my colleagues, I observed a relationship between increasing doses of alcohol and decreasing uh, fear response. Someone might ask, would that effect you've observed generalized to elsewhere in the world, specifically places where people really do drink and the types of fear responses that people do normally have to contend with? Those were questions of external validity. And to be, you know, to be fair and to not criticize myself too much, I would say, yeah, you know, experiments often have a harder time with external validity than do non-experiments. And that's why it's often hard to generalize about the claims that are drawn from experiments. Um, this picture right here is sort of funny, it always makes me laugh, and the, the reason why I included it here is a criticism that's often made about research that's done in university settings, much of it experimental research, is that it's almost always based on college students who are not like the broader population of the world, or even of North America. You know, people who are enrolled in college, you know, the, the kind of um, stereotypical, you know, sophomore psychology major is more likely to be white, he's more likely to, well, she is more likely to be a woman, um, person is more likely to be uh, wealthier, almost by definition better educated, having better access to healthcare services, having lower levels of mental illness than are people randomly drawn from the population. Now, the problem is, at least potentially, that if you find effects or you observe relationships between variables among college students, it's very tempting to say that those effects or those relationships just broadly exist in the population. And that they might, that might well be the case, but a critic or even just a concerned reader might ask, wait a sec, what's the external validity of these claims? How well do you think these claims would hold up if we drew a bigger and more representative sample of the population? Or if we used more natural seeming um, or more typical manipulations and methods that are more resemblant to how people encounter whatever constructs we're measuring out in the real world? Those would all be questions about external validity of claims. Okay, so if you're with me so far, you know, we've gone through the research process again. We've kind of reviewed it a bit. We've talked about research design. We've talked about research methods. And of course, now we're at the point of research data analysis. And as I've said in previous lectures, this is going to be the focus of most of the rest of the class. Uh, um, the first two lectures were to provide a background, to provide a foundation, hopefully to help you review some important information and maybe make some connections that you didn't see before. And with all that in mind, you're hopefully ready to learn more about research data analysis.
And in the next class, or the next video when I record it, which hopefully will be pretty soon, we'll talk about some basic descriptive statistics that we might do with a sample of data, talking about describing the shape of a distribution of data. And we'll also consider a simple example of building a statistical model for that data. How might we model a sample of data that we have? We'll start talking about some interesting ideas like degrees of freedom as well. But thanks for your attention. Eh? Thanks you for sticking with me. It's been over an hour of recording time. It's been much longer for me because I keep on making mistakes and have to back, having to back up. So if you've made it this far, thanks for your attention. I always do appreciate it. If you have questions, ask me in class, or if you're just watching this video on YouTube, post them in the comments area and I'll try and answer them. Um, I look forward to doing my next recording. I'll be back here soon and we can learn more about statistics and research data analysis together. All right, thanks so much. Bye-bye.